good morning and to some of you maybe good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for participating today. Uh, I would like to ask everybody to have their sound off. Um, but don't worry, we are happy to make it an interactive session, so please use the chat. Um, and for our speakers, just very important to leave your cameras on. Um, it will be our second webinar of a series of webinars focusing on the challenges uh, in mobility around the world. Uh, my name is Mika Masselink and I'm a community manager of the Smart Mobility Embassy, um, where we bring people, knowledge and expertise from different organizations and countries together. Uh, and by having an international community, we tackle challenges from different perspectives, uh, encouraging creative approaches and solutions. Um, and the coronavirus has put us uh, into a world lockdown. Uh, however, the positive effects uh, today is, for example, that we can digitally connect with almost the entire world. Unfortunately, there are still some time differences that can make it a bit harder. Um, and today we're addressing the challenges around dynamic traffic management. Um, in just a few years, traffic management management has been transformed from an everyday passive task for the road authorities to an important policy instrument uh, and new technologies enable road authorities to manage real-time traffic according to multiple parameters uh, and today we're talking to several experts uh, that are helping us find answers uh, on how we can elevate the field of traffic management to create more livable cities uh, here with us today as speakers are Tom van Dam, my colleague from Connect, Herman van der Vliet, who is working for uh, Peak Mobility uh, at Dinnik, and Jos van der Flerken from the city of Copenhagen, and uh, Simeon Calvert from the Technical University of Delft. Um, Tom, I would like to start with you. Can you please take us along uh, what is happening in the Netherlands according to traffic management these days? Yeah, thank you, Mika. Um, we're quite organized in the Netherlands. So if you look from above the uh, square meters, every square meter is planned. Um, and with about 9 million cars on the public roads in our tiny country, it's need, uh, needed to manage traffic properly. So uh, the main goal for uh, road authorities is to optimize traffic flow uh, and safety. And they especially um, the last few years supported in their task by new technology and other stakeholders. So to zoom in on the uh, traffic management in the Netherlands, we have multiple road authorities. Uh, if we zoom in uh, the area of Amsterdam, we see three different road authorities. The highways are controlled by Rijkswaterstaat. Um, they even divided in five different uh, traffic management centers, by the way, but the province of North Holland is uh, responsible for the secondary uh, road network. And when you enter the city, Amsterdam is um, uh, managing the traffic over there. So communication is key between uh, those uh, road authorities and is also key in traffic management. It's um, yeah, quite common for us road users to gain traffic information and receive the best route from A to B. But um, road authorities are responsible for their own area and traffic is not restricted by area. So you um, uh, cross different areas. And you, if you, can, you can imagine that when Rijkswaterstaat is closing uh, an highway for, uh, for instance, an accident or maintenance, they, there will be more traffic on the secondary road network. So um, to prevent congestions over there, you want to inform the province about this action. So road authorities are, uh, you, they were calling each other um, all day long to inform them about the current situation. And it all had to be implemented and responded properly and manually. Um, since 2012 in the Netherlands, the industry, together with the road authorities, sat down to develop a, a protocol to exchange dynamic traffic management information. And that protocol 
uh, was allowing the road authorities to, to communicate automatically and also real time. Uh, regardless of the supplier of the network management systems. So this allowed the authorities to manage their roads with external knowledge. Uh, on European scale, uh, there's also collaboration uh, between road authorities within C roads. Um, there's a platform for CITS deployment, and uh, that's providing the road user, uh, for example, roadwork warnings, um, despite whatever brand or uh, their vehicle is or uh, which country they can come from. So internationally, there is also uh, communication between uh, different road authorities um, yeah, to organize traffic management properly. Tom, you already mentioned the communication and the sharing data is, is key, but mm -hmm. how, how do you organize that? How do public and private parties work together in this? Yeah, um, um, naturally road authorities having their own data resources uh, by loops in the roads, for instance, and uh, they provide information uh, about the current situation. And traffic management is based on that information and will be distributed to the search providers. That's how the road users are gaining information. Um, but because of the smartphones and also the uh, uh, systems in vehicles, so the EOBD ports, uh, service providers can also extract information from the road user. Um, and if you get data from a lot of road users, you are able to create the same information um, uh, the road authorities are collecting with their own equipment. Um, but on a, a bigger scale, because you don't uh, necessarily bound by highways and the, the hardware is installed over there and with lower costs. So collaboration between public and private parties is more and more necessary and the service providers uh, will provide their customers with the best route per individual but sometimes you don't want to send all traffic on the secondary road so um, yeah um, to bypass the, the traffic jam, um, or you don't want to detour cars along uh, schools during opening or closing times. So there's a challenge for societal benefits against the individual benefits. And that's the, the challenge between uh, private and public collaboration. There is a project uh, in Europe uh, called Socrates, where both public and private parties are experimenting collaborations between them. That's a very promising project running in four cities in uh, Antwerp, in Copenhagen, in Munich, M uh, München, and also in Amsterdam. So um, it's not easy uh, because you have to share data. Um, but yeah, it's great that the project is, is uh, finding out how it works and what's needed to, to be successful. Okay, thank you, Tom. Well, you're talking a lot about cars and looking into my day-to-day -day life living in Amsterdam, I see the active mobility increasing uh, actually over the motorized vehicles. Do you also um, manage these modes of transport in, in the Netherlands? Yeah, there, um, there are 23 million bikes in the Netherlands, so there should be any form of management on active modes. Uh, public space is getting more cars, so uh, mobility is playing a big part in it. We all know that image of 48 people in a bus, on a, by car or by bike, and the, the space they are consuming. Um, the car is eating a lot of sp space in our cities. A parked car is using 10 times more space than a bike, and driving it is even more. So it's about 28 times more square meters in public space. Um, and to, to gain the benefits of chosen mobility uh, modalities by the road user, we should more actively manage on all modes of transport. And during COVID, we also travel less, so we see congestion dissolve uh, within this pandemic. So the question is, can we organize less usage of the motorized vehicles and stimulate active mobility? Uh, and that's a that's uh, a, a role for the road authorities to to actively 
uh, manage different modes of transport. The, for instance, the uh, example, the city of the Hague is investing 65 million euros in cycling infrastructure to to optimize um, uh, yeah, active mobility in their cities. Organizations like DINIC can optimize the traffic light controllers to benefit also the active mobility. Okay, I think we will hear more about it from Herman later. So my last question for you is what do you hope to hear today from also the other speakers? Yeah, I'm very curious, uh, curious what uh, the city of Copenhagen has to say about traffic management and how to uh, uh, yeah, how they see their role given all the new forms and information and also communication. And also I hope to hear what uh, in the end is prevailing traffic management for collective optimum or traffic management for individual road users. So I'm uh, looking forward to it. Me too, me too. Thank you, Tom. Um, I think it's time to move on to Herman. Uh, Herman, thank you for joining today. Welcome. Could you please explain to us the difference between traffic management and dynamic traffic management? Uh, well, yeah, of course. It, it, partly it's already in the name, uh, uh, saying dynamic traffic management. That means adding the word dynamic um, and adding dynamics to the traffic management that we are used to. Um, I would say that uh, as in many industries, uh, the word dynamic basically means uh, quicker anticipation on changes. Um, for traffic management, you could say this means, uh, for instance, adaptive traffic control based on the actual presence of the traffic rather than on the expected uh, amount of traffic. Um, so maybe even better if you say it's based on the predicted uh, presence of the road users in the near future. So basically what you could say is that if you predicted the, the near future, you're most likely closer to the truth than assuming it's the same as it was before. Um, so th those are the, the steps taken and that actually maximizes the use of the road infrastructure or, and maybe even postpone or, or prevent huge investments on the road infrastructure. Um, since, well, Tom just explained how much uh, space we need uh, in comparison with modalities. Uh, and at the end, uh, full is full. Uh, but if you can maximize the use, uh, that, that will definitely help to, uh, to, to maintain the traffic uh, throughput and flows. And I think <clears throat> even beyond this, nowadays the, the CITS functionalities are adding a lot of dynamics in traffic management. Um, not, not only uh, serving the, the people with those functionalities, but also serving road authorities uh, with the possibility to set policies around that. Um, and and that, that will help to make decisions uh, that will also help to influence maybe driving behavior or cycling behavior. Uh, and it will help to make traffic management systems to, um, well, let's say, make better decisions, real time, adaptive, and increase the flow as well as the traffic safety. Thank you. Um, and I know DINIC is not only active in the Netherlands. So do you see a difference between the challenges or the, or the use of traffic management in the Netherlands and elsewhere in the world? Um, yeah, and, and part of this, Tom explained uh, uh, what our challenges in Holland are. Um, but I think that traffic management around the world has evolved in, in, in many, many ways. Um, maybe both uh, locally uh, based on historic reasons or ways of working that have been established. And they're quite different in, in, in regions of the world or, or countries or maybe even smaller regions. I think in uh, the Netherlands, we are faced with dense population and that drove us already to optimizing the traffic uh, management for many, many years. Um, however, uh, you could also say that it's comparable to larger cities elsewhere in the world uh, with lots of inhabitants. And, and, and if you only look at those cities, it's probably the same density of inhabitants as we are facing in Holland. Um, so I think we can learn from each other how you uh, manage that and, and, and how you uh, cope uh, with the challenges. 
And, and I would express that one remarkable step that we made in Holland is the, the recently finished talking traffic program. Uh, I think the Dutch government started that program uh, five, about five years ago, building uh, a new uh, ecosystem uh, for traffic management and that adopts the CITS functionalities. It also standardizes traffic control and data sharing from that perspective. We just heard the, the importance of data sharing here. Um, and traffic light controllers, for instance, are no longer a standalone system. Uh, they are part of that ecosystem and share information with road users and vice versa. And that is a huge uh, step. Uh, uh, and also we have to get used to that, uh, but we already see the effects uh, uh, and, and how it helps to even better optimize the traffic or even better use the space that we have. And I think this is also an important step towards the, the connected or cooperative traffic uh, that is coming up and maybe at the long term, uh, um, which is also a nice question always, what is the long term here, but for automated driving, right? Because as soon as we uh, support automated driving, we should be at the highest level of sharing accurate, uh, reliable data. Herman, you mentioned talking traffic. Uh, how would you describe your role there as a tech supplier or a provider yeah. of hardware and software for traffic management? Is that also the role you want to play? Where does your responsibility start and where should or do you want it to end? Yeah, I, well, it, as a company, we are much broader than the, the, what we do in the talking traffic program. So l let me explain a little there. Um, I think that, that Dynic is a, a global player in delivering solutions both in, uh, in energy parking and mobility markets. So we're already, if we say talking traffic or traffic management, we are zooming in into the mobility market. Um, we deliver uh, road, uh, roadside equipment, uh, traffic light controllers as an example, but also highway management systems. Um, and we also do uh, public lighting systems, so it's still a broad perspective. Um, but if we, we zoom into a little more uh, related to traffic management, um, then we include uh, in the projects our own system. So we also develop uh, the systems ourselves. And uh, the traffic light controllers is an example, but also uh, ITS applications. Uh, in our case, it's called uh, the inflow product which is very capable as, as a network adaptive traffic management system. Um, and also we have been involved in, in, in many of the early stages of CITS developments uh, and European standardization projects um, that uh, by now resulted in a number of products that we, we can also deliver. Um, and beyond that, we can also deliver uh, services uh, for specific groups. Now, if you look at talking traffic, we are, uh, uh, I think, a key player in, in the traffic light controllers and, and uh, ITS applications. So we were the first with Inflow to uh, uh, gain uh, uh, the certificate for the newest functionalities that were requested. Um, so we are very proud of that. But on the other hand, we also developed services, for instance, Greenflow for trucks is a service that we now offer to trucks to get prioritized uh, green at the intersections without disturbing uh, the, the flow of the other traffic. And uh, also there we are extremely proud to be able to do that. And it couldn't be done without the ecosystem that was built with talking traffic, right? And, but we see the same need everywhere around the world. Uh, so in all countries that we are active, we see the same uh, need to on one side optimize the traffic and on the other side deliver services uh, to make use of the, the new possibilities. And it's it's a, quite a challenge to get to that level um, since the, the state of development of traffic management is different everywhere, but the needs are similar. So we're finding our roads and, and pathways uh, to make that happen. And then where do you see the your responsibility? Well, yeah, our responsibility uh, lies in, in, in delivering products and technology and services 
uh, to, to serve uh, the road authorities, uh, but nowadays also the, uh, uh, the road users basically. Uh, yeah. So that, that is broadening. And our responsibility, I think, is to, to deliver uh, great quality solutions um, to improve the, the traffic management, but also be a, a part of this ecosystem, uh, delivering the right data and, and uh, connecting to other systems. And do you believe you can take the responsibility that is now in the hands of uh, the road authorities? And do you even want that? Well, that, that is a great question. <laughs> Um, there's much to say about this. I'll, I'll, I'll try and keep it a little short <laughs> uh, because we are not a road authority. We, uh, we deliver uh, systems and services, um, uh, but we also see that the world of the, the road authorities is getting more and more complex. Um, uh, since, uh, well, the, the, the main focus of a road authority, I, I would say that they focus on safe environments, uh, livability, uh, for the inhabitants and make decisions and policies around that. Um, but on top of those traffic engineering functional approaches, uh, the, there's an increase of, of technology necessities or technical necessities. For instance, communication networks, privacy security considerations, which are getting more and more important. Um, and as a mobility provider, I think we can definitely uh, partly take those responsibilities and they could be delegated to us. And ultimately, I think we we aim for delivery of flow as a service. So not delivering single products, uh, but be more uh, responsible for the flow itself um, and take away all those uh, technical uh, necessities from the road authorities. So from that perspective, I would say, yes, that's what we want. Um, but from the other perspective, towards the, the livability, it, it's always a cooperation and the end responsibility would be at the road authorities. Yes, all right. Well, because of the time, uh, I have one more question for you, Herman. How do you want to elevate traffic management and what do you want or need uh, from the audience, for example, here today? Uh, yeah, well, I, I already expressed earlier that in the longer term, uh, I do see a shift to automated driving. And, and I think that's an important driver of what's happening uh, the coming years. Um, there will probably be a lot of different opinions on how long this will take. Uh, but what I do find interesting is there will be a period um, in which we start transitioning to that. And during that period, there will be uh, actually more types of, of traffic and users and, and different kind of users, whether they are automated or not, and they all have to work together in traffic management. So um, I strongly believe in, in distributed intelligent systems uh, to make that happen uh, and, and then provide cases like, like GLOSA uh, for driving behavior and other sites priority services uh, to maintain, uh, uh, well, maybe even mobility as a service like functionalities. Um, but I am very interested in how people in this group will look at that and if they see similar uh, drivers uh, and also think that we are now at the first stages of getting there. Um, so uh, the questions that I would have is, is how do we, uh, for instance, uh, um, uh, see the future of scenario managers. If we have more intelligent systems out there, do we still need them? Uh, or is that solved differently? And I'm also curious about uh, opinions uh, on this transition phase. Do we see that phase coming? And what steps are people taking already uh, moving in that direction? Thank you. Some clear questions also for the audience. Um, but because of the time, I would like to move on to uh, Jos from a, a municipality's perspective. Um, Jos, working for the city of Copenhagen, um, what is your definition of livable cities? And how do you also, for example, measure this? Mm. Yes, um, good question. Um, so we would measure it primarily with uh, with qualitative measures, of course, of course, uh, uh, interviews, 
uh, for example, of our citizens. Um, that that would be a, a strong measure, especially as it is a qualitative uh, question, right? In a way, uh, but we also, when when talking about about traffic as such, uh, we do see that that um, cycling, walking, just the active modes of transport, for example, um, increasing traffic safety, of course, uh, uh, that is very important, uh, reducing uh, emissions. All those, um, all those contribute to creating a livable city. Uh, 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 Tom mentioned mentioned uh, uh, density, um, so so um, uh, population density. We 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 find that population density increases livability in many ways. Um, it 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 brings together. Um, well, it creates the opportunities of having everything you need within, let's say, walking distance at least, uh, or, or if not a, a cycling distance. Um, so, and that is that is a positive driver for for making neighborhoods uh, livable. Um, so, so um, we're looking towards we're looking towards kind of, and we we do see overall we we understand of course, like every other city, the necessity of motorized vehicles, the necessity of goods delivery. Um, but we also do see we, we're starting to uh, deconstruct our city into neighborhoods and then looking like looking at what is a not a livable city, but just a livable neighborhood and a livable city should be uh, constructed of a lot of livable neighborhoods, so to say. And considering all these uh, parameters like, for example, the air quality, but also the traffic flow, the road safety, how do you prioritize or organize this? Yes, well, it's it's in, in the end, it's of course a political decision. Um, at the moment, um, bicyclists are are the most, well, pedestrians are the most high prioritized uh, mode of transport. The problem is our ability to kind of um, manage pedestrian traffic is limited uh, uh, until until further notice, so to say. Uh, so, so in, in practically bicycling has the highest priority right now in traffic management. Uh, then comes public transport, and then cars uh, in in uh, in the end. Um, so that is one way of actively kind of um, and and policy wise and operationally uh, kind of moving towards uh, promoting a, li a livable city. At the moment, at the moment we. With regards to the, the the foundational data to be able to do this um, this traffic management, so to say, we use well we use flows flows and and uh, and counts amounts of of, uh, of vehicles, so to say, and, and cyclists. Um, but we are moving towards we are installing uh, air uh, quality measurements at the moment, um, and and we we are we are starting to look more at at other data sources, which might be also uh, kind of um, inform our, our uh, scenario management and our traffic management in general. OK, well, we've heard Herman before talking about uh, their responsibility. I'm curious to see how you see your responsibility and also if you're uh, able and willing to outsource yeah. this responsibility. Well, very much like Herman said, um, we are a road authority uh, and that that responsibility cannot be uh, delegated. It can, it, we, we feel that that is simply that is our uh, raison d'etre or our function of a public authority. Uh, we are we are the arm of the politicians. We make sure that that uh, that everything is is the authority that everything is managed uh, um, uh, well. That being said, we do believe that the, the, the market and the private sector, of course, can create services like Herman uh, 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 told about. So so we will never be able to delegate authority, of course, um, that that would be that would be. But we do, of course, have uh, suppliers, contractors uh, and and which we which we, of course, uh, pay for their services uh, in relation to to what what they're doing. And we do also have we do in the city of Copenhagen there there are a, a number of private services on the market for road users um, that are fully um, uh, well uh, fully operate on the on a private uh, uh, basis. So in that sense, um, 
authority will never be able to be delegated. Um, responsibility basically also not because it will always be the road authority's responsibility. But that being said, services uh, and solutions can of course uh, and will mostly stem from the uh, the private sector and the market. Okay. Um, what do you need tomorrow to execute uh, or what do you need tomorrow to execute your job even better? Than you do today and how can the people here help you with that as as everybody here i suppose knows the market for solutions and services uh, on traffic is car centric right at the moment still car motorized vehicles good uh, goods delivery it is of course there's there do exist services for cyclists but but the majority of all services are for cars and motorized vehicles uh, and and what we need to hard, to larger degree is to have um, well services and solutions uh, even just the, the 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 ability to acquire necessary data from from cyclists um, uh, that that is something that could make uh, mine and my colleagues work uh, much better tomorrow. Um, everybody knows about uh, TomTom, Inrex, floating car data of different kinds. This this data simply does not exist or, or let's say an intermediary service that provides this data based on multiple data sources uh, from different fleets, users um, that is representative and big data and has a big scale. Uh, that does simply not exist at the moment. And why is this? One should suppose there is a business model for it somewhere. But um, but yeah, so, so something like that services and solutions for cyclists and then we can move towards pedestrians which is even harder i suppose um, yeah. okay well thank you very much jos um our last speaker today uh simon uh, you are not a hardware provider nor a road authority so what is your role in dynamic traffic management Okay, yes, uh, so indeed we're not um, our hardware provider, our role authority, and um, we don't pretend to be. Um, at the TU Delft, the university in Delft, um, we're very active with traffic management, but much more from a systems perspective. So um, while uh, companies like Dynic may be involved in uh, innovation and implementing uh, specific products, we have the luxury of actually going for um, high risk potentially low uh, reward type uh, solutions. Um, and I say low reward because we, we can take the risk of trying to innovate, but not end up with a product if something doesn't work at the end. But hopefully in many cases we do want to end up with um, a new type of technology that can also help traffic flow um, through traffic management. And part of that um, is also being involved in seeing how effective um, specific traffic management measures can be. So um, we have a large group that are actively involved in uh, data analysis and modeling. And um, so I lead a, 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 a research lab, the data lab, which is involved heavily in this. And part of that is actually trying to understand many of the complex behavior, behavioral interactions that exist between vehicles, also with infrastructure and with the systems that are trying to influence um, these vehicles and maybe their uh, behavioral patterns on the road. And these models can be very complex and um, what we try and do is perform the research which allows us to develop these models so that road authorities um, have tools that they can then apply to um, uh, effectively measure how effective um, traffic management can be but also proactively do this uh, to forecast if they should implement specific measures and in which way so this, these are things that we are very heavily involved in in regard to traffic management so and what are the main challenges there you already said it's very hard but what what is very hard um so i mean when you look at uh traffic management um i think i mentioned uh, already firstly in regard to uh, the complex human behavior so basically when you look at traffic traffic exists out of human beings controlling vehicles so to be able to actually understand um, how traffic management can be effective, you need to understand um, how humans behave and will be affected by the specific measures that you implement. Um, so part of it is uh, understanding um, how to influence uh, humans, but it's also to understand what their reactions are 
um, once they've been influenced. And this is what we try and do in many of the models that we develop um, when looking at um, forecasting models that allows, allow us in advance to predict how effective measures could be. I think another challenge that we also see, uh, especially on traffic management, um, is a trend that um, we're going to see more and more in the coming years, and I think it's been touched upon a little bit already, is that we're going to be moving away from maybe a more centralised roadside approach um, where you may have uh, route guidance panels um, or other types of roadside infrastructure to a more decentralised in-car types of systems. So it could be that um, you have a screen in your car which um, highlights a specific route that you could or should follow or it might um, you may have maps in your car that indicate what speed you're meant to be going at instead of having these things roadside. And it also can mean that um, traffic management can be more personalised. But with that also comes the danger of uh, potentially going away from a system which is very easy to control by road authorities and is maybe going to be more dominated by service providers. So like Tom Toms or the Googles um, who are offering these services. Um, so there's a bit of uh, a challenge there to see how road authorities and service providers can work together um, to aim for what we'd call a system optimum, so a, a traffic system in which you have uh, optimal traffic flow, uh, safety, um, also environmental impact, and not go towards a system that is focused on the user, but act actually for the entire traffic system may make things worse in the end. Thank you, Jos. Hearing also the perspective from Simeon, take 2025, for example, how uh, will uh, traffic be managed in your cities? Yes, uh, well, I do. I do agree. I'm. I think. I think we we will be moving to some degree away from um, from uh, from road uh, infrastructure. Uh, so so physical, let's say, variable message signs and whatnot. Um, I think I think there will be a a larger degree of uh, of environmental zones, um, which then will influence uh, which vehicles can 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 go where. But uh, the the um, the information about these um, in, uh, very um, environmental zones can also itself be variable and be dependent on the um, on the uh, on emissions, and therefore uh, be shown on um, uh, digitally on in vehicle, for example. Um, so, so I think everything will be more um, specific and more dynamic in many ways uh, towards towards the circumstances which which are present in any given day. Um, I think, yeah, and and I hope to see, of course, um, I hope to, that that we will go towards that that um, only the people that absolutely have to use a motorized vehicle for the per for, for necessary purposes do use a motorized vehicle um, we will never shut the city off uh, well as such uh, but but we want to um, behaviorally promote uh, well the convenience of other modes compared to, uh, to to motorized vehicles and but that's that's more um that also has to do with planning it has to do with new solutions making making other modes more convenient uh, which which also is cits and its uh, and and other digital information technologies um so yeah that's that's in general what, where we're going towards we have a hard goal in copenhagen of being carbon neutral uh, by 2025 so that's uh, that we we're, we're kind of uh, we're in a hurry <laughs> so to say all right well, thank you. Um, we have five minutes left. Uh, are there any questions from the audience or are there any questions uh, from the speakers between, uh, uh, well, questions for the other speakers maybe? Yeah, there's one question in the chat from uh, Lesio uh, Trovara about uh, managing big data about single users. Um, so we see nowadays uh, data is, is collected uh, from road users to implement in, in traffic management. Uh, do we, you think um, <coughs> we need a restrictive law regarding data treatment? Um, is that for, for me, do you think? <coughs> Maybe? 
I can answer at least uh, to some degree. Uh, we are not interested really in the individual road user. In, in we, we don't need any of their background data or anything. We are interested. Uh, we are interested in trips, of course. Um, so uh, point A to point B, uh, origin destination. For that, you will need some data from individual users, but not necessarily over a longer period of time. Um, GDPR is a bit difficult uh, as any location data is um, from my understanding. I'm not, a, I'm not a legal expert on this this question, but from what I've been told, uh, location data is by definition um, um, uh, personal uh, information. Um, so, so it is a bit difficult, but but it is workable. We we can we can aggregate data in different ways, and where it still is very usable for us, um, without without um, compromising the privacy of the user and the citizen. And that is um, regardless. I think even if technologies were present that that allows uh, allowed us, we we wouldn't want uh, pri uh, the the privacy of the citizen is is paramount. So. So uh, even if GDPR was not there and we could take individual data and put it together with our Facebook data or whatever, we wouldn't want to do that. Uh, so so that's that's the position of, of uh, the city of Copenhagen. Thanks. Uh, we get another question. How you guys consider about LiDAR technology using in uh, ITS ecosystem? OK, uh, I'm willing to give that a go. Um, so basically with LiDAR, what we have is um, a way of detecting um, the environment um, based on light. And LiDAR is commonly used in uh, automated vehicles to detect their environment, to perceive their environment. Um, I could see this eventually playing a role in, in the sense that uh, once we have a more connected uh, ITS ecosystem, um, these vehicles can communicate um, between each other and also with maybe roadside units um, and indicate what's going on in certain areas. So, for example, if your own vehicle is a connected vehicle, it may know if there's congestion three or four streets away because another vehicle has communicated or there's congestion there or there's an accident has occurred. And I think using this technology, certainly within a connected ecosystem, um, can probably, uh, well, not solve many problems, but certainly improve um, efficiency in the city. And this can happen for um, for ve uh, vehicles, but I think there's also options to to investigate this in a broader sense as well. So uh, that's maybe what, what my take is on this. Thank you. We have one more question from Delia. Yes, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Delia Mitten from the EID Urban Mobility. So I have a question for Herman. Uh, since Dinik is way, uh, working quite a lot in the Netherlands with the state authorities, how does he uh, experience this cooperation? And also with the, um, with the authorities outside the Netherlands, since Dinik is a uh, global, let's say, player. What are the differences or what can you take away from the Netherlands to outside, to abroad and the other way around? Would be interesting to hear your opinion on that. Thank you. Oh, uh, well, that is quite a difficult question because uh, I hope you're not. You're and not only trying. one minute left. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll keep it short. But I hope you're not trying to, to make, uh, make me do uh, <laughs> statements about our customers. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just curious no, based it, on your uh, ex yeah. experience. Well, in, in general, the, the, the road authorities and governments are our main uh, customers. Uh, of course, we also did deliver uh, outside to companies and, uh, and more private sector, but most of them is the road authorities. What we do see in general is the cooperation is extremely good. Um, not only a, a simple, uh, uh, simply being a customer relationship, but what I most of the time experience is the fact that we're driving towards the same goals and, and that really helps working together. Um, what I also see that, that in, in the new developments, what we offer is uh, more tools and technology for, for the road authorities to actually uh, define their policies and directly implement them uh, in the systems on site. Uh, and that is, that is a movement I see happening both in Holland and abroad is that we get more and more involved in, in traffic engineering discussions uh, and policy making discussions 
and, and finding the best of two worlds in policy making on one side and the technology on the other side. So I, I strive for cooperation at that level. I see that happen a lot uh, in Holland, but also uh, abroad. Uh, so I, I don't see a big difference uh, from behavior. What I, I see a big difference in the current state of technology or decisions made in the past. Um, so it's more the difference is more in how to move towards the future uh, rather than in the behavior and the relation that we have. Well, because of the time um, we had scheduled till 11.45, at least 11.45 in the Netherlands. Uh, I would like to thank you, Jos, Herman, uh, Simon, Tom, uh, but also the audience today uh, for sharing your insights uh, and particularly all the challenges you're struggling with. Uh, via the Smart Mobility Embassy, we hope to continue having these discussions uh, and aim to work together to find uh, solutions. Uh, I hope it was a fruitful webinar for, uh, for you all. Uh, you're always welcome to reach out to us with further questions, requests uh, or specific interest. Um, we have our next webinar scheduled on the 28th of April, where we will get together with some experts on the challenges in creating and implementing mobility hubs. Um, for now, I would like to thank you all and uh, have a good day evening, morning, afternoon, uh, wherever you are. Thank you very much for your participation.